Don't give up when someone denies you your right. Thank you very much. This is this month's legislative update. Continue pushing it a step forward. We two bodies are all not alike. Yeah. Right? If you give people the chance and the encouragement and some supports, amazing things can happen. Hello, I'm Mark Hughes. Welcome to Disability Viewpoints. And we are back on the air from our new uh, space at SPNN here in, in uh, St. Paul. We are honored today to have uh, Chris Sears from the Star Tribune as our first guest. Joan Wilshire is a co-host. She's executive director of the State Council on Disabilities. And then we have Nikki Villavincencio, who is also a co-host on the show here. Uh, welcome to the show, Chris. And I know we have a bunch of things to talk about, so we'll go ahead and get started. Terrific. And I'll let okay. you uh, run down your list. Thank you for having me. You're honored, welcome. Honored to be here. Let's talk about, for, I think the first and foremost is February 2020 isn't really too far away if you mm -hmm. put it in perspective. And some of the articles you've ran have some pretty pertinent information as to what's going to happen on the legislative side of things. So I think we'll let you start there. How's that? Well, thank you very much. You know, I, I really um, don't know what legislators are going to do about this, but uh, we've been running a series of stories um, in our paper. They started running last month called uh, Chaotic Care. And it's really a deep dive look at our Medicaid uh, waiver system and looking at what people are getting across the state. You know, we have about 90,000 people with disabilities in the state that are on a Medicaid waiver of some sort. Mm -hmm. And what are they getting? So about six months ago, we started to look at, um, you know, traveled across the state, met with people all over the state. And what we found is that there were these really wild disparities in what people are getting. And this may not come as a shock to people at this table, but you know what a Medicaid waiver will get you in, say, Polk County can be dramatically different from what it will get you in, say, Dakota County. Right. And so we spent a lot of time with these families, and one of the uh, shocking discoveries we, we made is that we have in the state what's called our waiver migrants. People are actually uprooting themselves, selling their homes, packing all their belongings, uprooting you know, their, from their communities, from their families, and moving hundreds of miles away just to get the kind of services they want and the kind of waiver that they need to support their children, in right. many cases medically fragile children. So these disparities are obviously not what was intended when we created medical assistance in Minnesota. This is supposed to be one for a, all and all one for one. Exactly. And so it, it shouldn't be that you'd have to move from one county to the other. Absolutely not. No, it, you, you should, you should, it should be consistent across the entire state. Maybe that's one of the points we have to make in testimony in the 2020 legislative system. Absolutely. To get legislatures to see the picture. I think a lot of times that's what's happening in the hearing rooms is that the legislators okay. are doing their, they think their best and they are. I, I won't discount that. But they look at everything as a balance sheet. You know, how much does it cost as opposed to how much does it help this person and why would you need this? Why do you? And I think those questions are left open ended a lot of times. And I don't think until the legislature sees the case, as opposed to the balance sheet, balance sheet to make the whole picture come together, I don't think they really get what the disability public needs. And that, I think that's what we're missing. Right. That's why Chris, the point needs to be brought up. I've got a quick question. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Department of Human Services has a, a part to play in all of this? Absolutely. I mean, they, they, DHS plays a huge role, mm -hmm. one could argue the most important role. They oversee Medicaid. Um, they have the power to um, enforce the Medicaid rules. They have the power to tell the counties um, how, to, how to evaluate people for waivers. And so, um, frankly, I don't think they've been doing enough 
to ensure that the system is consistent across More the whole state. More oversight is needed? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. The other area we looked at was how people are being assessed. So everyone at this table knows this, but um, to, to actually get Medicaid services, you have to go through this rigorous process mm -hmm. once a year where you're evaluated. Uh, someone from the county comes into your living room and they usually carry a laptop and they do an assessment. And that process is or can be very agonizing for people. And what we found is that the process itself is, is imperfect and that what you get can vary dramatically from year to year based on the person who comes and does the assessment. And that can change dramatically from year mm -hmm. to year because there's huge turnover among assessors who come in and evaluate yeah, people with disabilities. There may be a varying opinion there. I, I totally agree. And that's what you, you want to help mm -hmm. support you. But at the same time, you don't want to get caught at something that's going to be a, a penalized uh, situation. Right, right. So there's there's a lot there that could be could be improved. Basically, the assessment process is inconsistent. The results are inconsistent. What people get can often be arbitrary, and it can upend people's lives. I mean, you know how important waivers are, mm -hmm. right? They can literally determine whether you're living a happy, independent <laughs> life yeah. and whether you're you're not. Yeah. So. Absolutely. So I think what it, like what I hear is you're saying, and we need to tell the legislature, um, have a, we need to have a standard of quality of care, you know, and that varies, like you said, from county to county, assessor to assessor, and um, I think if you if we think like you're saying, they look at a budget, they see what what does this provide, but what they're missing is the fact that if one service is providing a high quality of care, then it's not worth f cutting just because this other program helps so many more people. Well, and I don't sure. think they're seeing who needs yeah. a service and how bad they need it. And, uh, Absolutely. You know, they're just doling out the budget. Well, we got 35% of the total budget can go to this. Here's the allotted budget, but no more. And there's people that need more, there's people that certainly need less, but you have to have an open-ended assessor. You can't have, you know, one that has an opinion this way or that way. It can't be swayed. Right, right. I also think that there's been a change in the way we do this in, in Minnesota. So when we created this system called MinChoices, which is the evaluation system, we, we basically created a whole new uh, uh, job force uh, of assessors that would go out and do evaluations that was separate from social work. So we, it used to be that people with disabilities came to know their case manager and their social worker and the same person would typically visit every year. When they created Min Choices, it changed all that. So you basically get a new person almost every year and that person doesn't know you. Uh, and so if, if I don't really know this person, if I don't know Nikki or if I don't know Joan, and I haven't ever seen them before, I'm not going to necessarily know their history and their background. And I think, you know, that's a bit of a problem that we've created this kind of bifurcated system. Right. And it's become more impersonal than it, I think it needs right. to be. I think we have to go back to just having conversations with people and taking it slow and finding ways that we can get people to, um, to get folks to open well, up. We, ha we have to have the longevity that this person's been your assessor for the last four years. It's seen you in the peaks and the valleys. And I think everybody goes through that at any age, but that's the, that would be a plus to the person receiving the benefit, is that this assessor who has been with you for four or five years and maybe longer knows you know, what to expect. And uh, that can also shorten the evaluation time, if you think about it. So, other things you're working on? Well, there's more on this uh, Medicaid uh, issue to come. So, we have several more stories in the series, um, one of which is going to be specifically focused on uh, the amount of money we spend on MinChoices. Right. It's, it's become a huge expense, uh, north of $600 million um, that we've spent on this program that many people um, believe isn't working, as we've discussed. And then we're going to be uh, looking at 
how we're spending the Medicaid money, um, specifically on, on group homes. About two thirds of our three billion in Medicaid waiver spending in the state is going towards group homes. Now that's not a knock on group homes, but there's a question of whether um, we really need to be investing that much of our waiver funding specifically in, um, in residential settings and whether perhaps more of that money could be going to support people in their own homes and their own apartments um, so they could live more. That's kind of what you want. Uh, I know it's not February 2020 yet, but have you had any conversation at all with the governor's office as to any feeling as to how they're going to react? I mean, this is Governor Wall's still first year, so we got to give him a, a fair chance. But any any uh, any inkling or, uh, as to how uh, he's he's going to have an opinion on all these? Have you talked to him? You know, on, on this issue, we haven't talked to him yet. I I, I know I've heard from a number of legislators. Um, uh, Representative Jennifer Schultz, for instance, has said that you know there will be there will be hearings on waivers. Um, come the next session, so that's reassuring to hear. Mm -hmm. um, there have been several other legislators that have reached out since our first story appeared, and um, I know they're concerned about um, the disparities in particular and that it should be consistent across the board. So I think we'll have obviously some conversation about this come, come spring. Um, I'd like to see it sooner. It, it's great you get that kind of input because I think Jennifer Schultz and she from Duluth, there's there's a, a, a varying of opinions throughout the state. And I think that's good we get that because we're a metropolitan area. Some of those are rural. And, and you need to know what everybody needs if you're going to make the whole program work, I think. So I think it's great. And I think the governor needs to know uh, pros and cons. Mm -hmm. And I, we were at that breakfast, Nikki and I, it was pretty early in the morning in Maplewood uh, this summer. And he wants to downsize government. And so as we go into the 2020 session, we got to keep that in the back of our minds, too, is that, OK, here's the flow chart. But how, how big or how small is it going to get in the near future? Because the, gover the governor is looking to really downsize departments. Mm. So. Well, and I do know that uh, both the governor and the lieutenant governor are going to do a walk-a-day with some with um, a couple PCAs and clients coming up in the next few weeks too. Great. So. Are you going on that? No, I won't be there. But <laughs> <laughs> that's super important that they get out right. and see that. I mean, the, and the amount of work, how difficult that work is, and they see it firsthand. That's a any comment, Joan? You have on this? You know, it's a, a needed a service. It's if you're talking personal care attendants, yeah. um, for people just to be able to live, you know, work and play, as the, the theme goes, for most people with disabilities. So it's, it's um, just incredible to me that we can't get enough action out there to well, and, um, put and, some money into yeah, it. Yeah, and the SEI union, union was, was formed, and that was a big move at the state capitol, and something in the right direction. But they're saying now, uh, if you're paid 12 bucks an hour, your PCA probably won't be very reliable. How can we make it so that the program's enticing? And they asked me one day, and I said, well, why can't you make it hours per service or a tiered system as to experience? The more experience you get, the, the more you climb up the ladder, the more money you get, and, uh, and make it work that way. And I, I never heard back, but all you can do is suggest, and they're either going to listen to it or not. But you know, it's it's an important thing. The PCA care issue is somebody that helps you get ready in the morning, and then makes it so you can get to your your Metro Mobility bus, and you'll be down at the bus stop before Metro Mobility will be there. We know that, but you're on your way to your job, school, uh, library, wherever you're going. So the, that's but without that PCA caregiver, the idea of having the caregiver is that you can't do the things that everybody can do. And without them, you know, you're missing one step in the morning. So it's, uh, it's a big issue. Well, and to connect it to group homes, I think we need to look at it more as all support care, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's a big obstacle that we have in Minnesota is like, yep, there's these PCA programs, there's group homes, but really the people who work in the group homes are support staff just like PCAs are. 
And so I think that um, DHS and government people and legislators need to look at it as that more together than right. apart. And then if you want to bring up Olmstead, the Supreme Court ruling from 1999 of allowing people to live in the community of their choice, there's absolutely no reason why they shouldn't be putting dollars Right. spread it out for those that are in the, right. their apartments and then their own place. We got a couple minutes left and uh, so I, I want to cover this but of course our big news in the disability community or pretty big news is we've had a data breach at Metro Mobility 15,000 of us got hung up in that. Uh, we're having some other issues with Metro Mobility. We had a big computer outage on, in January of this year uh, and we've heard all kinds of reports that uh, the computer is a Windows 365. We didn't have the second sign on. Uh, management has to have some accountability. And this really has to go to the governor. And we'll get it there. But I have never been so upset in all my life. Uh, we're buying a service, buying a product. And, and we're not getting, oh, well, thank you for letting us know. Uh, oh, that's too bad. It's more than that. These are how people get from point A to point B. Now we're not asking to ride in a limousine, but we're asking for it to be on time and management to have some credibility and we're not seeing it. So we, ha we have about one minute left. Anybody have a final thought? We gotta continue to work with our legislators and our governor, that's the, the main thing. We've gotta get the word out about all the important issues. The, uh, the PCA care issue, the other thing you have, you reach a certain age in life that you didn't have to have it before, but now you come down with affliction. Now you have to have one, so you have to adjust. And then you finally realize that you didn't realize before how important these services are. And we might as well plug Community Tuesdays as long as we're here. Every uh, Tuesday, our disability community gets together down the cafeteria at Mendon. Chris Sears, you're invited. Uh, and we talk about legislative issues and try to get legislators there and then go out and see our legislators and some of us are there every day. And uh, so it'll be an interesting session in 2020. And so we hope you'll stay tuned to the show because we'll try to update you. And we'll be right back with more disability viewpoints in a moment. Welcome back to Disability Viewpoints. I'm Mark Hughes, and this being our uh, maiden voyage or our first show, we thought we'd introduce uh, some of the co-hosts and anchors who are probably more important than I am, but they make this show come together. But my name is Mark Hughes, and I actually started in the broadcasting business my sophomore year of high school at then KTCA TV Channel 2, doing a local national feed show with Gene Jaberg, who actually helped me kick off this show at CTV back then. He's passed away now, but he's uh, the forefather that was really responsible for what we're doing and getting it on the air. And so I kept that connection and it's important to me and there's other broadcasters who are big in my little world and I think you all know who they are. Uh, but then we uh, did some work for Jim Ramstead, Jeff Bangsberg and I and Jim asked me to come to Washington, D.C. to do this show out of the house studios, believe it or not, where they do NBC's Meet the Press. So there again was an, another nice honor that I couldn't turn down, but flying to Washington, D.C. one day to do the show, the next day to fly home the next day is kind of a 24-hour whirlwind tour, but we got it done, did it for quite a while. And then we brought it back uh, to uh, CTV and they had a executive administrator change and kind of a format change where they wanted us to go two segments at 15 minutes. And where this show went statewide, we figured we couldn't do that. So we've been on hiatus till now, but we did celebrate 20 years, which is a big, I'm trying not to cry, a, long time. a big milestone. Uh, but in broadcasting, there isn't any broadcaster it's Alec Krasinski from Channel 7 in Chicago. If it's our local anchors here, there isn't any one of them that'll tell you, I did the news all by myself tonight. Because that doesn't happen. It takes a plethora of people. Even at this level of uh, being invited back into SPNN, it takes a plethora of dedicated people. 
and I believe that's what we have. And so now I'll let them introduce themselves. And I thank each and every one of you for watching at home. But more importantly, I thank the people who are behind or ahead of me. So with that, uh, Nikki, I guess you're next. Thanks, Mark. And um, my name's Nikki Villavicencio, and I was asked by Joe and Mark to come on Disability Viewpoints. I started as just a disability rights activist. <clears throat> I interned at Gillette Lifetime. And you know, my thing was to uh, find other folks with disabilities and um, help them tell their story to the public, to legislators, um, or just in their own lives, help um, get some direction. And um, you know, what I hope to really bring to the future of Disability Viewpoints is um, to show that uh, folks with disabilities, we have pride in who we are and what we are and the things that we do in life and we bring things to society that other people uh, may or may not. And so I hope to focus on that part of, um, of the disability culture is um, disability pride and, and sharing your story, um, sharing your story with the public because I think it's important because when we share our story um, in a public place, uh, we, we see that we are more alike than different. And I think that's really an, an important thing to, to remember. And then I'll give it to Joan. Hey, thanks. Um, I'm Joan Wilshire. And yeah, it's been great being a, a co-host. And last year, in the last couple of years, we've done some fun things on, on my time of the show. Anywhere from, we had Miss Minnesota and Miss um, America, Minnesota was here visiting, and we've also done uh, quite a bit of work on ADA in Minnesota and all the lawsuits. So one of the things I'm trying to do is really um, bring some of the law pieces um, for people with disabilities to understand what their rights are, but I think also uh, we really want to hit home that we're also having fun. I mean, we're thinking of bringing back the movie girls where we review movies and we even talk about sex, I know. So um, <laughs> it, we can have fun on this show too. So it's about fun, but also not forgetting about our civil rights and where we've come from and where we're going. So I think that's a big part of what I'll be looking at focusing on. And can't forget when Nick and I did one together. That's a good transition, Joan. We are all about having he fun. He doesn't forget that either, Joan, yeah. don't. It, we are all about having fun. Um, one of, one of uh, one of my favorite segments over the last handful of years that I've had an opportunity to co-host was doing a collaborative segment with Joad that uh, analyzed the headlines of some news stories and kind of pulled out what was important to the disability community and how, you know, taking that approach and kind of looking at it with a context of a sense of humor mm -hmm. is always important but also analyzing some of these stories and saying, well, you know, how is this gonna make a, make a difference for somebody with a disability? So, without further ado, my name is Nick Wilkie. I, uh, for the last 13 years, I've worked at the Metropolitan Center for Independent Living, and uh, through, that, through that office, I've had an opportunity to not only work in advocacy work, but also do a lot of um, community-based initiatives, um, one-to-one -one goal setting with individuals, um, highlighting community programs that the center is either involved with or um, involved with directly or doing collaborative work around, highlighting some of the work that we do, but also shedding light on um, other things that um, disability culture might be interested in. Um, one, of the, one, of the first, one of the first shows I did about six years ago was um, mounting a GoPro camera on uh, my motorcycle and uh, kind of show, showcasing that, um, you know, if you're interested, if you want to, um, if you have a disability, if you don't have a disability, there are all these opportunities to get involved with out there. And I really, um, I really enjoy um, promoting those kind of stories and really highlighting the excellent collaboration ideas that this group of people ha has, as well as um, what we're able to bring in and what we're able to showcase from Thank our you. wonderful community. Thank you, Nick. So, so with that, I'm going to hand it to my left, Amani. It's wonderful <laughs> to have you back. 
Thank you. I'm Imani Cruzen, and I originally started on Disability Viewpoints as the teen co-host, and now I'm no longer a teenager, so <laughs> I'm sort of... You graduated the University of Minnesota. Right? Yes, I recently We're graduated <laughs> with a degree in journalism, and I'm just sort of interested in continuing to sort of cover the topics around disability that have come up as I'm as I've been growing up and sort of what I think would be relevant to young people with disabilities and um, I'm really excited to see sort of what new topics I can cover because um, I think there's always something new coming up that's interesting. <laughs> well great, it's great to have you all. And I might as well tell you who my forefathers were in this business, Ron and Paul Majors. I owe them everything to what they taught me how to do this. So thanks to them and we'll be right back with more Disability Viewpoints in a minute. Welcome back to Disability Viewpoints. This is now what we call the final word segment. And we're going to give it to Chris Sears today from the Star Tribune because he has some interesting information always about and one on a recent court uh, decision. So Chris, we're going to let you take it away. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, this is a court case that we've been following. It was uh, filed about three years ago. And it was filed by a group of people with disabilities um, who live in or have lived in group homes. and. I think it's a monumental case, and what they argued was they were never given the option to live in their own in the community, and because they were never told of that option, uh, they argued that their rights were violated. And in a historic decision, uh, Judge Jonathan Frank, uh, long a friend of the community, uh, ruled in favor of uh, the plaintiffs and, and said that uh, the state, specifically the Department of Human Services, has been violating uh, the 14th uh, Amendment of the Constitution, Due Process Clause, as well as the Federal Medicaid Act uh, by not requiring that counties um, actually inform people that they can use Medicaid, not just for group homes, but also to pay for supports to live in the community. So it's a monumental decision, and um, where it's going to go from here, I don't know. But that they have to be given notice, right? They have to be given notice, and if, if they're denied, if, if they can't get those services to live on their own, they have to be told that and put in writing that that service has been denied. Then they can appeal it, then they can get a fair hearing. The way it's been going on for decades in the state is people have not been told, they've been in limbo, and because they've been in limbo, they haven't been able to get a fair hearing when they disputed it. So I think it's a monumental case that is really gonna open the doors for people Great. Um, Great. years from now. Thank you for that information. Thanks for being on this show today. And do, my, do any of the co-hosts have a final word before we go? Quickly? It's just awesome to be back. It is. Thanks. It feels good. Anyway, that's it for this edition of Disability Viewpoints. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time here on SPNN. Thanks for watching. I'm Mark Hughes. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.